Absolutely. Thank you, Atar. So for those That's that have been here for a time. while, you know our next guest. Uh, he <laughs> is a co-founder of different... Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, there was a yeah. bit of lag what from happens? your end. There was a bit of lag from your end, so I, I, maybe you should do that again. Because it just felt like you saw yeah. these top for three seconds. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Man, you just you just got your perfect cold cut, by the way. This yeah, I know, mess. I know, I know, <laughs> I know exactly. I, I I wasn't gonna touch it because I knew that this was too pristine. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I don't know. What do we do? How about we try one more time? If it doesn't work, then yeah. I'll try. A... Right at that moment. <laughs> empathize with to such uh, a personal extent yeah <laughs> no, keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> i'm so glad you're recording this this is gold oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Hey, it says it's fast now nice <laughs> should we do the clap test yeah let's do it all right oh let me stop god. sharing Okay. Sorry to interrupt the time. Okay. That's it. Okay, perfect. Cool, cool, cool. Three. No clap test this time. Three, <laughs> two, one. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Different Boats, Same Storm. If you're confused, slash intrigued about the setup that we have today. Believe me, you're not alone. I don't blame you. These are all very familiar faces that you've seen in the past. And if you haven't, go check those out because they're all gold. But today we have a very, very special guest with us who, I don't even know if guest is the right word, more like the prodigal son who has finally returned. Abhe, why don't you take the floor now? Yeah, thanks, Atar. So today, as you might see, if you're a longtime viewer of Different Boat Same Storm, you'll recognize that our guest today is Eli Meadow. Eli is uh, a good friend of ours. He's actually the co-founder of Different Boat Same Storm alongside us. Uh, and Eli, again, is a good friend of both Atar and I. He's helped us start break the, um, start Different Boat Same Storm. And uh, it's, Eli, it's so great to have you back on here today to talk about our experiences over the past year. How are you doing? Man? It's it's good to be back. This this fits like an old coat, you know. But it's also it's nice to be a fan now, and and it's a nice kind of change of perspective. It's good to see you both. Oh yeah. Well, there's a lot of change. Speaking of perspectives, uh, Eli looks very different from what he looked like. What do you before. mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Sorry. Well, this is exactly the banter that I have to say that I miss so, this, so this much. This is actually why I left. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> the puns oh, got man. to me, man. Oh, I couldn't well, take it any longer. We had a follicle. That's what we had. <laughs> oh, <And>, damn. Uh, <laughs> I'm walking into them left and right now. Oh, uh, I've missed this, but it's so good to have the trio back and honestly it's it's i just got a notification on facebook today saying that you have a memory with abhajit singh suchal and elon meadow and i was wondering what's the memory uh is it like some pictures from first year and then i found then i realized that today was the exact day actually that we officially launched different boats same storm no way and we actually. did not plan this for context we did not plan this episode to be recorded on this day, but I woke up this morning and I just saw these memories. Wow. So it's been literally exactly a year. Wow. Our anniversary. Well, cheers, guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's our anniversary today and so much has happened. Beautiful. Awesome. No, it's it's it feels like it's been longer than a year, but it also feels like it was yesterday. And I mean, for yeah. me especially, like both you two have flashy new backgrounds. I guess a part of your background is flashy, <laughs> but it's new. Uh, I'm in the same spot, and so it's, it feels like it's been like the same date again and again. Eli, um, I mean, how have you been over this past year? And what have you been up to? Like, so we know you were in Toronto for school. You're back in Victoria, BC now. What, what how have you been? Mm -hmm. 
I've been I've been good. I I really can't complain. And um and yeah, being able to be in Toronto has been fantastic. Um, I'm back in Victoria now, but spending uh, all of second year on campus uh, with Atharv was a great time, and it's been good. Um, it's been helpful. It's been more helpful than I can say to have two places to bounce between because the change of scenery is is so crucial to not going crazy. Um, and actually, it was oh, yeah. was part of in in the the rougher times in first semester. Being able to leave, um, even I did a trip for oh, yeah, three days to Niagara Falls, which is a depressing place, a re- like a really awful place, except for the water. Um, but, but having a, anything that's different can, can really recharge your batteries. Um, and so that's been very helpful. So, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a really good year, um, aside from... The COVID part, everything except for the COVID part, has been pretty good, um, and right. yeah, I mean it's it's it is funny. Wow, for it to have been a year, it's it's funny how this podcast has lost zero relevance, um, and is only it's it's been honestly, guys, it's been such a pleasure to watch this grow since I've left. I've been, I mean, I'm super impressed. It looks like it's going great. Um, and yeah, it, I'm, I'm very, I'm very thrilled to be here to chat with you guys. Can I just say though, before we say anything else, for calling Niagara Falls depressing, you might lose your Canadian passport. <laughs> I don't make the rules. Fine, the American <laughs> side is depressing. Canadian side is depressing. <laughs> That's okay. That's Good okay. Good save. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh, well, I relate to the change of scenery so so much because. I, I think among the three of us, I've probably hopped around the most. Yeah. Being in Mumbai for six months unexpectedly in a summer, which would have been a lot of hopping around, which Abhay and I keep talking about all the time. And then being in Toronto and then random trips during winter break to get that change of scenery to summer now where I was in Houston for a couple of episodes before as you all might remember. And now I'm in New York and just that change of scenery. And I think just any kind of movement, be it physical or sensory or temporal has really been a defining factor in how sane I am in any given moment. Totally. And at least you get the, the next month to catch your breath. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and in that, with that in mind, how have you been out here? <laughs> yeah, no, a great question. And like, that's the thing, right? It's like, I've been at here this entire time. And I think what you said, Atarv, it's not just that physical change in scenery. It's also that temporal and emotional ch- like change that. And so for me, like I haven't been taking summer courses, right? And that's a big difference from like being in school mode. Right. And I've been managing an internship and doing an internship and starting some research and like the podcast and the fact that other things have changed, but like I've been making minor adaptations. I think that's what, um, I think that's what also helps to keep you sane and mentally mm-hmm. healthy uh, during a time of immense change in the world. And like, uh, you know, before, the, before we even started recording, we were talking about this, like now we're moving into a post pandemic world. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, almost, and it seems like we'll get there within the next six months, let's say. But that change now, it feels like it's so much more radical than that initial change of like being at home. Like going back into the world is that yeah. change. That I'm kind of scared of, to be honest. Like I'm not mm-hmm. scared of meeting people. I'm not scared of like, you know, seeing my friends, but I'm scared of being in a crowded lecture hall with no masks. Yeah. <laughs> like, Eli, Eli you, you, talk, you think and you talk a lot about like um, the emotional state that people have been through the, during this pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think it's like, even now, as we're still in this pandemic, um, you know, where people feel like they need to be productive all the time, uh, or maybe they don't yeah. want to be productive and like, they struggle with that. Like, what do you think the balance of that will be like now moving past the pandemic? 
Yeah, well, the first thing is, and Atharva, I think you you hit the nail on the head with the word movement, because that's mm. what I described. So I, I went through a rough patch, um, like I alluded to in first semester, and part of my crawling out of that hole was doing copious amounts of introspection, self-reflection. Um, and, and a product of that was realizing that perhaps my greatest fear is standing still. And, and those are the words I used. And so to hear you say movement and change of scenery, it all, it all clicks with me because I think that that is crucial. The going stir crazy is, is very much a psychological um, slash temporal slash uh, spatial thing. And... And so, yeah, to, to have, and by movement, I, you know, for me, that movement looked like getting back into creative projects after I'd hit kind of a, a dry spell, because otherwise when, and in, you know, so the way I was looking at movement was more purpose and figuring out, you know, when you're, you have some purpose in that you have a class to go to the next day, you have a deadline in a week and, and those are joyous things to look forward to and keep you going. Um, but then also, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much more helpful, maybe specifically as an artist and as a creative person to, to feel like you have space to move creatively, like you're working on a project. And if one of them for some reason or another gets, um, halted, then you have something else to turn your head to, or you can keep pushing. Um, so yeah, that was just to touch on the movement thing. And, and, and then to segue back into your question a bit, I think... I think the biggest thing is, as things open up, more movement is possible uh, in, in every sense of the word. And, and that will be travel uh, related for sure, but I think it'll also be um, just the doors that open for people creatively um, or in, in any other sense. And so the, the struggle, I think, is we're, we haven't accessed that full range of movement yet. And so within the confines that we're given, how do we stay productive? Or, or is pr productivity even the right thing to be aiming for right now? And that's been, so that's been at the front of my mind recently. I had, and Atharv and I were just talking about this. I've had conversations with really smart people, really hardworking people who are high achievers. And, and something that's popped up occasionally is this, this, oh, I, I talked to a professor of mine the other day, a screenplay professor, who he's a poet, he's a filmmaker, he's always doing things. And I asked him what he'd been working on. And he said, I mean, Eli, I'm, I'm sleeping and I'm eating and I'm walking around. And, and that if I can do that, then we're going to be okay. And it just hit me like a truck because these are people that, you know, I mean, they, they hate to stay still because creative, that squashes creative people. Um, yet... Even highly accomplished people are, are facing that. I was listening to um, a podcast, one of my favorite park podcasts with Mark Maron, and he ends so it's his not episode. DBSS? Oh, it's not oh, DBSS? Second, second oh favorite. Oh my God. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> um, and he ends his podcast by saying, congratulations, everyone. You did it. Another day. And it's, you know, it's that, right? Like if we can make it through the day. And... And I think to so many people, that feels like a really low bar and it feels too low and it feels excruciating that that's, that's what's expected. I mean, it feels, it feels like you can do more, you know, it feels like a complete curtailing of your potential. Um, and I've definitely had, although I'm, I'm working, I'm doing, my work is very creative. Uh, I'm juggling a few creative projects at the moment. I'm still finding that there's, there's too often I'm hit with this, this kind of self-doubt, I'm plagued by it, of am I being productive? And, and then, as I say, I think the question is, how much do you worry about whether you're being productive or not? And I'd be curious for you guys' thoughts, because you've been, you're both extremely um, productive people, and, and you guys are always moving. And the podcast is a great example of that, because this has been ongoing, and I imagine has given you guys a sense of continuous purpose but i'm curious what you guys think about that yeah well that monologue could have been filmed <laughs> uh and put out for 
motivational purposes. Yeah. We should probably start uh, or, recording about now, hey? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, with the at first it's me with like the you know essay prompt that's like seven seven point five times you Roman and Eli responds with that essay. Like, <laughs> I love this. This is why this works. This is why this works. I have so yeah. many thoughts, and I'm just going to go through them as and when I remember them. Please. But you know, when when you're talking about movement and how. It's not where you're moving, but rather the fact that you are moving that is important. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it's, it's, it's a theme that I keep thinking about all the time in that if you have a central purpose, a why, mm -hmm. then what you're doing and how you're doing it always takes care of itself. And what you're doing at that point almost becomes immaterial because that is just a means to an end that is the why. And mm -hmm. when you have, when you've committed yourself to that why and you've inculcated that in your being, then that also comes with the cognizance that the means are endless. The means to get to that why are endless. And you also have the motivation to keep perpetually seeking those means. So any mean being shut down, any road being shut down does not impede you as much. Because you're mm. literally serving a higher purpose than that specific task. Also, another side note, with all this talk about fear of stagnancy, I'm still here. You might want to change that name. <laughs> 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 or maybe that's the focus. Maybe that's the lens. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's another thought that came into my mind. Yeah. Well, if I can just quickly interject before you, because I've got to jump in. I think what you said is is perfect. And I think it, it hits at the fact that productivity is too often defined in terms of output, not yeah. in terms of progress. Yeah. Um, and, so, and, and so changing that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that we often confuse outcome with output. Mm. Whereas outcome is how far you've come. Mm. and output is what has that gotten you in the moment output is backward looking but outcome is forward looking and mm. it is anything that I have learned from this entire period which is still ongoing is that looking back only helps if you're using that to move forward but looking back for the sake of looking back and trying to go back will only leave you in limbo. It'll just leave you stagnant. Yeah. And a lack of growth is something that is not something that any of us should be aspiring for, I would say. Because that's, I believe, when you stop growing is when, for all intents and purposes, you stop living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is so deep already. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I just mean, yeah, like, I'm thinking of productivity and how I, how I, like, Eli, you asked a very interesting question. Um, how does productivity or the level of productiveness that you experience define your self-worth? Um, hmm. And and how does it make you feel when you're productive versus non-productive? And, like, I, I felt non-productive many times during this pandemic. And you talk about the podcast, like, we stopped the podcast from, I think, September hmm to around what was it april tarf uh we well i think it was february when we properly started shooting again but then there was still a bit of a lag but yeah it was a while and those are like what six months of the this half of the year where uh, tarf and i are like okay let's get it started again let's get it started mm. again. we're talking about it back and forth and i i think worse than um you know not being productive uh, for me at least is like saying that you want to be productive but yeah. they're never actually fulfilling that minimal amount of thing that we need to do. Because all we mm -hmm. had to do was get together on a Zoom call and record us talking, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think uh, creating those barriers in your own head that like, oh, I need to do this first or I need to do that first. Like, yeah. I think that could honestly be more harmful, um, more harmful than like not doing anything at all. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, is... I, I mean, I'm wondering, Atar, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, no, this is something that I'm so glad you brought this up because I think the difference in the mindset is that when you're being non-productive, 
you're committed to not doing anything. So you're, you've, made, you've made peace with the fact that you're not going to do anything right now. Whereas in the other state, there's a battle where you want to do something. So you're in the zone of, I'm going to do it. But the circumstances mm -hmm. that you're in, or just your condition, your mental, physical, emotional condition at that point, mm -hmm. is not best fit for doing it. So there's a, there, I think there's a gap between what you've committed to doing and your capability at the time. So that internal struggle, I think, is what makes that such mm -hmm. an aggravating experience. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a curse of procrastination, right? Oh, it's, yeah. I mean, the, the feeling of I, I could have been doing something, but instead I spent hours thinking about what I could have been doing yeah. and then realizing that you're not happy with that. And so I think that's definitely one thing. And, and what you guys are talking about in terms of putting one foot in front of the other is something, I mean, that's my life mantra, is putting one foot in front of the other. And we, I talked about this in my deep dive in the first season with Moyuk, is yeah. drive, right? Um, but what's interesting to me is drive is, is crucial, but in a position, you know, if, you're, if you find yourself in a position where you've hit so many roadblocks that you're at the point where, I mean, you can't, you can't put your, your foot to the pedal and you find that you're, you're waking up and you're eating and you're sleeping. Yeah. Is, is that a failure? And I don't think it is. I think, it's, I think it's probably tending more towards recharge, which is overlooked and scorned upon because it, recharge doesn't seem productive because it's, in, it's invisible, you know? Um, yeah, so again, Eli, like... I still struggle with this idea of productivity because I feel that, like, look, us three are relatively high achievers. We enjoy getting things done because they feel good. And like you said earlier, Atarv, like, it's working towards that purpose that you have. And so by not doing anything at all, does it at times feel like you're not achieving that purpose that you want to fulfill? Like, again, I'll, I'll give a personal example. Like, this summer, I was probably supposed to write the MCAT. Uh, I'm looking at med school as an option and I didn't end up doing it because I realized that uh, time-wise with my research and my Break the Divide internship, like it probably wouldn't work out. But there was a solid month from around May to June uh, and you know half of June where I was like half studying and half trying to um, get my study schedule together where I wasn't actually studying. Uh, it's like that typical phenomenon that we were talking about earlier where it's like, you're a student and while you're studying, you're also watching Netflix. So the Netflix doesn't feel good and you also don't feel good about studying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, get, I don't really have a question here. Like what do, what do we do about that phenomenon? Yeah. And what does that really mean? Like to be in a state where you're not getting things done, but you want to, but it also doesn't feel yeah. good. Like, yeah. What do you think you like? Yeah. I mean, it's tough. And also if you are a high achiever and you're a driven person, the last thing that you want to be told is, Hey, no, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's a pandemic. Give yourself <laughs> yeah. a break. Cause you just want to say, well, well screw the pan. No, <laughs> I could be, I should be, could be doing better. Yeah. Things. There's somebody curing cancer half my age right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't stop you unless you want to be stopped to an extent, but the, and then at the other, you know, the other side is I'm, I'm certainly not saying that, you know, while, while I want to make it clear that for me and for the other people I'm talking about, if you're, if going to sleep and waking up and eating is what you, what is, what you need at the moment is, and that's how, like, I mean, you're kind of fighting off so many demons that that is a successful day, all the power to you. I've, I've been there. I may be, you know, I, I'm sure we've all been there in, in some sense. And so you, you don't want to say that that is um, unproductive. But, but also you don't want to say that it is because then you fall into this trap of, well, pro productivity is, oh, it's whatever you're, I mean, every day is productive and that's a little hopelessly optimistic. Um, yeah. And so I think we can approach something better by first, like we were talking about, redefining what productivity means and not defining it as something that's output-based, but looking, like you said, at outcome looking at learning and looking at progress. Um, I've been working for two years now on trying to get uh, I'm Still Here, the short film, made. And, I mean, we haven't shot a single scene. But I feel very much like the, the past two years have been incredibly productive. And, you know, and that's hitting smaller milestones and knowing that, you know, 
even just just it being front of mind and being something that you work at and, and chip away at slowly is is very much something to be proud of. Um, and I think, I mean, as an artist, it's difficult. I think in any profession, as an artist, you're almost by definition defined by your art. Like that, that's, that's what you are, you know, yes. you make art. And so if you're not making art, then you're not an artist or you're not a good artist or you're not a productive artist. But it's a trap, right? Because, I mean, how, how much of, of an artist's time is, is spent engaging with the process directly? Or, or engaged with an actual product, not not that much. A lot of it's, you know, a lot of it's the thinking that goes on in the shower. So, take more showers. <laughs> <laughs> right. After that entire, after that very thoughtful monologue, <laughs> that's that's what we're going to take away from this. Take more showers. Yeah, yeah. Don't Absolutely. don't you cut that out of context. Don't oh, don't not. make that the only thing that I say in response to that question. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's going to be the title of the episode. Take more showers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I can 100... Uh, I'm sure between the three of us, we could 100% spend the rest of this podcast elaborating that into a metaphor that's, like, perfect. <laughs> You'll change I mean, the name of your podcast. There's only one way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Same oh, water, man. different shower head. Take that one, guys. <laughs> No, we're getting there, though. We're getting there. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, takes a while, but oh my god, yeah. so many shower thoughts. Should I call them? Is that what we're calling this now? Shower thoughts. So many sh- shower thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel. I I think we've all felt this at some point. Is sometimes I think you feel like you're like a snake. You're just coiled up and you're waiting to strike. You know. And there's, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. In some ways, I I don't feel the reason I don't feel I've slowed down, even though it's been. Um, because of COVID, I haven't been able to make a film for a couple of years is because I've got four screenplays that are in a drawer ready to be pulled out and, and ready to be put in the hands of actors. And I've got, um, you know, it's like you say, it's, it's setting those goals, right? Because if you can't do something now, if you can't, if you can't put your hand around a camera now, it doesn't mean that you can't start making a film. Yeah. Um, And yeah, when it comes to, I'm still here, I mean... You, when you're hit by a whirlwind of obstacles and some of them are the world and nature and COVID and some of them are people and institutions, it's like you take everything as it comes and you can push against some of it and you can, you can kind of let the rest of it pass you by until, you're, until the dust clears. Yeah. And tell them I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Wow. You know, uh, this is something that I personally experienced a lot all my life and also especially this past year. And something my mother told me that I have found so incredibly helpful and something that I'm working on all the time because it's hard is that anytime I feel like I'm not able to do things and I'm half heartedly doing them because I need to. Mm -hmm. She told me to just shut everything off and don't come to it until the time that I feel ready. And the metaphor there is that, you know, if you're going on a, on a drive and you're feeling you're edging towards low fuel, you could keep going. Nothing's stopping you from keeping going until you physically can't go anymore. But taking that pit stop is better for you because you know that the road is long. The journey is long. And you pushing Mm -hmm. now, despite knowing that you're nearing capacity, is -hmm. not going to help you in the long run. And you know that because you know the road is long. Mm -hmm. So taking that pit stop will not feel like you're deviating from the journey. It's a boost. And I think that analogy in mind is something that we can then apply to our lives and that more often than not, actually all the time, we are painfully myopic in the way we look at life. Mm. The deadline is what we're trying to get to rather than 
living our lives to the fullest. Mm -hmm. The deadline is definite. We can see it with our eyes. We know it will end eventually. And we think if we just get there, then we'll be fine. But that's not how this works. It's, it's a journey that is as long as you want it to be. That's how I like to put it. And if you want it to be long, then you will not feel bad about taking those pit stops because mm -hmm. those will only help you going on further. And I think that's yeah. a shift in perspective that I'm trying to inculcate myself. It's, it's, yeah. it's the long journey. Yeah, it's the long journey. It's not just what's right in front of you. And I think especially as young people, as university students surrounded by other people that are like high achievers and doing a lot. And it's wonderful. I think you can, you can fall into that trap of thinking, okay, well, I'm going to do as much as I can right now. And then I'll graduate my undergrad and then, then we'll see what happens. But that when like, let's see what happens should be a continuous process of like yeah. iterating on ideas, coming up with new ideas, taking some time away, like that artistic process that you describe, Eli. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. hundred percent. hundred percent. I would also say um, the last over the last two years, COVID has has affected me, seems to have missed me in a lot of important ways. You know, I haven't I haven't caught it. And I've been lucky enough to have most of the people close to me very safe and very healthy. And I've kept a job. And so for me, the effects have been predominantly psychological and the one of the biggest ones has been feeling and it's one of those things that by nature of this uh of what i'm about to say i'm not sure how many other people relate to it but it's it's this feeling which i think maybe comes as a surprise to people who know me that i've lost all my social skills you know which is is weird to hear from someone who's on a podcast as saying it on a podcast um, but it's, it was, and, and maybe it just kind of plays into, uh, the questions of self-doubt and whatnot. But I think, um, I think what you're talking about, about taking pit stops on the side is important. If you need to, uh, to push people away until you can pull them back even closer, well, why not do that rather than holding them at arm's length for however long, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's a long journey only if you want it to be. It can be short if you want it to, and it will be short if you don't take that pit stop. And just mm -hmm. realizing that, that if you, the goals that we set for ourselves, they should be milestones and not the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. They should be telling us how far we've come rather than this is where you were getting to. Mm -hmm. And this is as far as you will go. Yeah, and that's endings are brutal. I mean, it's every every time uh, a creative project is concluded, there's there's an overwhelming sense in every way that this is the end of the project. You know, it's the final cut. It's yeah. it's like the last showing, and so it's you know the the vocabulary around creativity and film and even theater is very finite. and it makes it makes it feel and perhaps the reason is because each project is just one stepping stone in the overall body of work that you're going to end up producing. But at the same time, maybe something more fluid is the way to look at it. You know, yeah. it's, it's the, the end of a shoot wrap day doesn't need to be as conclusive and as hard edged as it's made out to be. Yeah. I mean, I think the closure is important. Uh, and, uh, boy, have we had conversations about closure. <laughs> One too many conversations about closure. But I think the, the change in perspective there is that you've come so far, but this is not as far as you will go. Mm -hmm. You've got more places to be. So it is hard edged in that this is over, mm -hmm. but this is not the end. This yeah. is not the finale of your story. Yeah. Yeah. I think a I think a big part of it too is like and I remember I was in grade twelve and a high school teacher told me he's like Abe, uh, you know you've done a lot of good projects and stuff but if for the rest of your life you just want to be someone who goes to a beach puts on shorts and sandals and a t shirt 
uh, and you don't want to continue to do big projects, you're also going to be good. You'll also be fine. And like, I think that advice for me was something that like was an awakening because it reminded me to separate myself from the projects that I'm a part of. Because at the end of the day, the goal is not to be someone who runs 20 projects or has run 20 projects in your life. Like, Eli, you are not, I'm still here, man. Uh, right? And yeah. Atharv and I, we're not. He is. <laughs> <laughs> and like, right, we're all not DBSS. We are our own yeah. individuals. And like these projects yeah. and these things that we classify as um, products of our productivity, um, yeah. these outputs, you know, that's not all we are. We're trying to build ourselves to be better people who are, are good for the long run. And I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, I One other thing that I just want to layer on to this conversation is expectations. Like we have certain expectations about the ways things should go. Like we expect that school should be in person in September, for example. And when that expectation is shattered, like, and let's say it is for this coming school year, like, how will we react? And like, you know, initially you might say we'll be bummed out because we're not going to be in person and we're not going to have our classes like we used to. But um, another thing to add on to this conversation, like, what do you guys think? Like, uh, how do we shift our expectations in a way that is helpful for us, especially as things change? Atarv? i just say before we answer that very heavy question, <laughs> bringing up the prospect of another year of online school <laughs> is definitely going to trigger trauma. <laughs> I don't know if you should have gone there. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> right? But, right? Like, this is actually the question here. Like, even if it is online, we should prepare ourselves. Like, uh, I mean, should we but have it won't no be. expectations at all? Like, that's my question. But it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> Please, God. It won't be. <laughs> oh, man. I'm playing right into it, right? Yeah, uh, you are. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Eli, thoughts? It's it's an excellent question. I did I gave my grad speech on uncertainty and embracing uncertainty because I think it's huge. And one of the things I, I would say, um, if I can extrapolate, one of the things. So I'm currently working um, as a photographer and a videographer for a construction development firm, and it's a really awesome job. They send me all over the place and get taking you know, taking three hundred shots a day and whittling it down to a few oysters or a few pearls. Um, and one of the things that I've learned from this job is that it is, and from, from all the filmmaking I've done, is that it is, for me, much easier to be spontaneous after I've had a chance to prepare a little bit. And that's something I've found in a few different ways. It's even something I've found, and I think the way that's applicable to your question, Abe, is uh, as an overthinker, as a professional overthinker, <laughs> I've found that the best thing you can do is let your head spin and go down each of those paths, you know, five of which involve like murders and bank robberies and like, and then, you know, a couple of the ones that you're kind of icky about and a few of the positive ones and then shut it off and be ready for whatever comes your way, you know? And so I, I think um, in terms of expectation and preparation, the... It's inevitable to be, you know, thinking about the worst, contemplating the worst, bracing yourself for the worst, um, hoping for the best, um, trying to get the best to come about. But at the end of the day, I think what's important is that we each define our own boom. Now I'm going to shut that off. And whatever comes, I've thought enough about it that I have a good sense of, of what's on the way and I'll, I'll take it, you know? Yeah. I'm going to let my head spin. Famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it would work. Boy, was he yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. Ugh. There's, there's just so much to unpack here. But if I might dabble with this for a minute, another thing that I try to inculcate in in the way I look at the world around me and I present myself is, uh, I think there's a difference between having no expectations and not having any expectations mm -hmm. in that having no expectations means that your expectations are zero, but not having any expectations means that 
the expectations don't exist. There is a difference between an absence and a lack of. Not having any expectations is an absence, but having no expectations You're You're is... blowing the mind here. <laughs> well, you told me to let my head spin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and having no expectations is a lack of expectations. Hmm. Um, and I think what I found always helpful is not having any expectations, is that I'm not thinking about... I'm, that's not something that I'm thinking about because it's not within my control. Mm-hmm. Everything that's within my control is how I react to it, how I continue to find joy in the things that I can do, given the conditions and given the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Those are all within my control. But all the peripherals, God knows that those are not. Mm-hmm. None of this that's happening was within our personal control. Just, I, I find that ha- having that take mental toll on my mind is pointless because I could possibly have not done anything. So the comparative then is not pandemic or no pandemic. The comparative is pandemic and being miserable and pandemic and trying to not be miserable. Mm-hmm. And the trying is where my personal effort comes in. Mm-hmm. So that's all I can do. And I think... More often than not, what we fail to do is have the right comparative in mind. So that's just yeah. how I like to think of it. But I don't know if that was relevant to anything that was. No, t- that that resonates. Um, one one last thought I'd offer is, and I think I think this is something we'd all be able to relate to. Um, one of the pieces of advice I've given other people is, when things go wrong, it's a story. Right. So best case scenario when you're going to the airport is that you go through security, they don't stop you, you get to your gate, you have a donut and then you get on your flight. But if you happen to get lost and you happen to go and trespass into that blocked off part of the airport and you happen to get arrested, but also make your I mean, it take it all lick it all up right and that sounds happy go lucky because of course that's like me saying oh the pandemic's actually good because it's a story well like eh, i won't <laughs> give it that much credit um uh, but and so it is a double edged sword because i think that that advice is helpful because it helps you realize that anything that's against your expectation can also be positive and can also be valuable but the 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 pitfall that I dropped into um, that I've been working my way out of is there is also a danger to looking at your life as a story because Mm -hmm. I realize, especially in a social setting, it's too easy for personal, important personal events or psychological events to become anecdotal and for that to become their sole purpose where your experiences end up being fodder for for your attempts to become the life of the party. And, and that, I think, is dangerous. And I'm saying that as a storyteller, where everything that happens to me, I'm writing down so that I can put it into a screenplay. And wow. so it's, it's some walking of the line between taking things and realizing that they're building to your personal story and stories are meant to be shared, but also not relying on them um, as something to impress others. And I mean... Once you hit here, you start asking questions about if you make art for the audience or for yourself, and, and, and you can go, you should watch a Deaf Man Symphony for the answer to that question. But, um, I mean, it's, it's all over the place, and I, I think to, to neatly package that up, um, it would be that, you know, it, stories are crucial and are a good way to deal with the unexpected but also not something to rely on because then I think you, you lose sight of, of spontaneity and of yeah. what kind of magical moments that don't need to be retold. Absolutely. Oh, oh my God. As we wrap up here, like I have one more thought that I just want to layer on top of this um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I mean, so stories are that double-edged sword. Uh, and you talked about like looking at things as not necessarily good, but looking at them as a story. So let's say you get lost at the airport or you get stopped by security for a random security check another time. Like, I wonder why the three of us would get stopped at security. (laughs) Oh yeah. I wonder why. Yeah. Just 
there's no similarity <laughs> apart from the fact that we're just straight brown males. <laughs> yeah, that's and it. So, and so that happens. And um, Eli, what you're saying is that you don't look at it as like a bad thing or even a good thing. You look at it as a story and um, you kind of let go of everything that's out of your control. You take control of what is in your control. And Atari, when you talked about like that trying, like you're trying to make the pandemic less miserable. Maybe that trying, that in itself is productivity. Like that in itself is building yourself up to be a better person who's more than just their projects or their ambitions and the outputs that they put into the world. The outcome is how far you've come, how much you've grown as a person uh, and how much better off you are for the people around you. Uh, that's who you are as a person, who you are with the people around you and who you are with your cell phone. I mean, I thought I had a question in there, but I, I mean, I, I don't really, I, I like all of this coming together. It's like you live a better life by giving away control of what you can't control. And by mm -hmm. doing what you can to not necessarily say that all things happen for a reason or everything is good, but to say that things happen and it is mm -hmm. what it is in a sense. Yeah. 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 It's, it's make sure that your decisions are your own because then when the good things happen and the creative things flourish, you can take credit for it because you put the work in and that came from, from here. And then when the bad things happen, you don't go around pointing fingers. Absolutely. And if, if I may just add something to that, it is, I, I like to think of it as that this is what this is and what it is from now, given these circumstances is what I want it to be. And what do I want it to be given these circumstances? Context matters. And reminding ourselves of that context is very important because without this context you doing what you're doing right now would have a very different connotation in a different world uh, but reminding ourselves that what we're going through is very real and at any given time pandemic or not we're always going through our own things our own fair share of storms and those are all very real so just being again not having those blinders on of the world around us and our circumstances and the boats that we find ourselves in uh, is very, very important. And I know I just laid so many nautical puns on there, but that was my attempt at stand-up comedy. Thank you so much for coming to my TED Talk. Uh, yeah. You know, once you said storms, I knew you were going to get boats in there. Um, it's, it, it is a good name, but um, Eli, like, thank you. Thank you for making the time to come on here and just chat. Like, we should do this more often. Anytime. Yeah, let's do it again. Let's do it again. So thank you. Uh, this has been another episode of Different Boat, Same Storm. We've chatted about everything from Eli's life, our lives, uh, Different Boat, Same Storm, and that story, but also like a deeper conversation about the pandemic, about mental health about care for yourself and others and productivity, self-worth, expectations in life. Like it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, Eli, thank you again. Thank you guys. Thank it's you been so a pleasure. Much. We'll be back again next week, y'all. Different guest, same time, different boat, same storm. <laughs>